Ben is my co-worker, identical twin, roommate. We, we kind of do a lot of things together, teammate on the intramural field. So uh, we're, um, we're, we're together a lot. We do a lot of stuff on campus, around campus, and, and of course, write for the paper. So um, Ben, what, fill in a little bit on the background. Yeah, we're, we're big sports guys. We, we both really enjoy you know, doing that. We would listen to Texas Rangers baseball games together growing <laughs> up uh, as we fell asleep, and now we're Aww. essentially doing the same thing uh, 10 years later. So that's awesome. That's, that's one of the things that brings us together. Yeah, that's awesome. So tell me a little bit about your history with writing for the Ocala here at OSU. We, we both started writing our second semester of freshman year and um, kind of started on the sports side. Uh, we, we've dabbled in news a little bit, written stories here and there for news, but mostly on the sports side, been, been beat reporters for, uh, I think, every sport but wrestling here. Um, but between the two of us covering, uh, started on cowgirl tennis and um, did cowgirl soccer, uh, cowboy, cowboy, cowboy and cowgirl basketball. We were uh, writing for the football team now, so gotten to have our hands in a little bit of everything and uh, really get a, a feel for everything here. We really enjoy just being in that newsroom. Um, a lot of our closest friends and you know, uh, mentors are down there. It kind of feels like a fraternity in, <laughs> in a lot of ways. I mean, that's, that's where I spend all my time and you know, eat. And I've never slept in a newsroom, um, maybe other than a quick nap, but it, it feels a little bit like a fraternity. It's probably a good thing you haven't had to stay yeah, the night in the yeah. newsroom, huh? Because you know cause, cause cause we, we wouldn't be the first. <laughs> you wouldn't be? Oh, my goodness. It's a, you have to be dedicated, right, to or Macaulay? Or inebriated. inebriated. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> so you've been writing with the Ocali for a long time. Do you guys each have a most memorable story that you wrote for the Ocali or maybe one that's your favorite? I think um, w when you throw those words out at me, memorable, favorite, the, the story that comes to mind for me was a story I wrote last year um, kind of previewing the Remember the Tin game Oklahoma State had. Of course, um, as you know, the, the plane crash that went down killed 10 members of the OSU basketball team, and they, they honor that team and, and their legacy every year. But one story I did was um, obviously kind of one of the central figures in that was, was Eddie Sutton, coach of Oklahoma State, and I uh, – now, now that he's passed, th this past year, I, I, I got to talk with Sean Sutton and Steve Sutton and Scott Sutton, um, two of which are, are still in coaching now in the Big 12. And I, um, I talked to them about their dad and, and how their dad changed um, through that tragedy. And um, I got to talk with uh, some of the players from that 2001 team, too, like, like Doug Gottlieb or um, other, other former athletes that, that were on that team or, or new people on that team. And I got to hear about how Eddie Sutton kind of became a, a softer, more gentle coach a little bit, um, maybe a more introspective coach at times. So that was fun just for me, a little bit of an outsider to OSU history, kind of getting the, the inside scoop on, um, on how one of the most defining moments in OSU kind of changed the central figure at OSU. Yeah, my most, you know, one of my most memorable stories, um, you didn't say upbeat or cheery or, you know, rose-filled, but um, I, I talked to uh, OSU women's basketball coach Jim Littell days after he was fired and I mean, that, that definitely sticks in your brain because um, you're talking to someone who's been at the, at the school for, for over a decade and, and now he's on his way out and um, just to kind of sit there uh, courtside with him and watch him look out over the court for, for one of his last times and relive some of those memories will, will definitely stick in my mind for a while. Yeah, it sounds emotional too, you know, to be tied into those uh, two stories. Sounds like there's a lot of family involved and high emotions involved in those that maybe make them more memorable. I, th I think that's why we like writing. Yeah. You know, the emotions of it. Yeah. yeah, and you guys are probably more tied in OSU's community because of it and into the sports and the history of OSU. I think it's so cool. So if you you guys both wrote a lot for different sports teams here at OSU, do you have a favorite sport you've covered or a least favorite sport? Well, I'd um, – now that – might some people, the, the audience might not, might not believe me because one sport like OSU football, you're, you know, getting a luxurious press box and eating barbecue and – getting a, a, a free a free seat to um, a game that other people are paying hundreds to attend and um, but I'd say that OSU football you know cowgirl soccer I have really enjoyed a lot of them about the same because um, I think a lot of it is is getting to tell stories getting getting to know players and you can find those stories anywhere mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite stories that I've written was was about the cowgirl soccer team and how it, how it all came to be. So just throwing that as an, as an example, it, it is really hard to pick. Um, and, I, and I say that honestly, that it is tough to pick. If you have good food in your press box or some drinks, I will really enjoy covering your team. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the way I, I tend to look at it a little bit sometimes. But of course, it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, 
I, I really enjoyed covering the Women's College World Series. Uh, that, that was a lot of fun to, to be holed up in Oklahoma City. Feels like you're, you're out there all week, um, you know, for, for back to back to back games. That was a lot of fun last summer. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite college sports of all time is college softball, so I love to hear that. Uh, the Women's College World Series is one of your favorites. So that's all the time we have for this first segment here in the writer's room, but make sure to stick with us so we can hear more from Sam and Ben Hutchins all on the writer's room up next. My name is James Remedy. Fired Up Stilly is the name of the business, and I'm one of the owners. We all three met, the three owners, working as employees at a similar place like this. What I hope for is for everybody to feel welcome, like family. And not only do I want students to feel welcome to come here and study and use our free Wi-Fi, but also I want adults and families to be able to come in. We've built a connection with a lot of people, and you know, Stillwater's a big community, so we just want to invite everybody to be able to eventually make their way through our doors. Well, definitely the tees, I would say. Most people fall in love with them. They just got a great amount of energy, gets you going through your day, and it just kickstarts you to get you know, everything you need to done. For myself, it would just have to be you know, being the owner, owning something that, you know, is able to impact other people's lives and, you know, the way we can affect our community is something that I really have always wanted to do. We love our clients and our customers that come through every day and we enjoy getting to know them. Well, how I got started was my daughter said, Mama, why don't we rent a booth at the Quarter Horse Show? And it was very, very good because you know, when you're giving your jelly away for free, people really do love it. <laughs> but when you ask them to pay for it, then that's a true test. What makes my product so unique is the Scotch bonnet pepper. And the Scotch bonnet is a Jamaican pepper. And I had lived in Montego Bay, Jamaica for four years. So I learned how to handle the pepper and how to cook with it. I always say, you don't do this on your own. I mean. You have so many people that help you along the way. For me and for many of us, that's my name on that jar, and it better be good. Welcome back to the Writer's Room. I'm still here with Ben and Sam Hutchins, and now we're going to take a look at one of Ben's latest stories about the non-conference men's basketball schedule that just came out. So Ben, do you want to give us a little bit of a summary or synopsis about that story you wrote for the Ocali? Certainly, yeah. Um, the, it, it was fun seeing how OSU dropped it with you know, Mike Boynton's uh, son and daughter coming into his office and you know, they, they found it in their room um, they, to, to give to coach. So, so that was a fun little video to kind of introduce it. But um, I don't know how journalistically you know, stylistically <laughs> sound this is. Some of my professors might, might groan, but I use the word oof in, in this, in this uh, preview because the OSU non-conference schedule isn't particularly strong. Um, three teams on it made the NCAA tournament last year. One was a, a play-in team, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, a 16 seed, so, you know, kind of a tournament team in, in, in a lot of people's eyes. Not the strongest. Um, I have four bullet points on it, though. The toughest road test, I think, is going to be Virginia Tech in Brooklyn. Uh, it's at the Barclays Center, so not a true like road environment with a lot of hostile students screaming and yelling at you. But um, VT was a good team, had a good run in the ACC tournament last year. Sean Padula, that's going to be a fun little uh, thing to watch. VT's point guard, who is a local kid, uh, went to Edmund Memorial and you know was recruited by the Cowboys. Um, I think OSU was maybe in his like top three or something. So to see him kind of play against the Cowboys will be a little fun to watch. Um, bullet point number two is the best home game. Fans, if you're looking for, for tickets or, or whatever, um, Ole Miss, January 28th. This is part of the SEC Big 12 Challenge, um, a series the Cowboys have been about 500 in um, under Mike Boynton. Ole Miss wasn't very good last year, but they did beat a couple ranked teams in that SEC, so something to watch. Their key stretch is going to be at Oakland, not California, Michigan, the Oakland uh, Golden Grizzlies. Uh, Oakland came into GIA and beat the Cowboys last year. So um, to go to there will be interesting. It's in December. It's going to be freezing. They're going to hop on a plane and go to the Bahamas. I'm sure that'll be a much welcome relief uh, to go to play a little two-game tournament in the Bahamas. So I think that'll be the key stretch. Can you get revenge against Oakland? And can you have some success in a 
you know, environment like the Bahamas, um, like a true road trip like that. My last kind of, you know, takeaway from this non-conference schedule was a trap game. I think Texas A&M Corpus Christi, we mentioned them as the 16th seed last year in the tournament. Um, that means you can play, you know, you, you can win your conference, you can win games in a big time pressure environment. Um, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi might be one to watch. Yeah, and you know, you're talking about them, some of these teams kind of sneak it into the postseason tournament for the NCAA. How does being able to play in that tournament this season for the Cowboys or having that opportunity now, how does that change this season for the Cowboys? Do you think if they're going to play better because of it? Do you think this season now becomes a little more charged and passionate for them? Just what does that change for the Cowboys? I think 100% you're, 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 on the, you're on the head of it right there, Tessa, because – and you can ask the players. You can ask all the fans that were packing. Like, I guarantee you those fans, there will be more of them. They'll be screaming a little louder. The, the players will want it more because at the end of the day, it, it matters so much if you – have a chance to make March Madness. That's what every kid um, on that team wants. If you have a chance to go to uh, Kansas City and win the Big 12 tournament, all that is in the cards now. And mm -hmm. um, e even if you have a team like Oklahoma State who, hey, they might not have made the tournament last year anyway, um, even though they were banned, it's just hard to factor in how much playing for a chance at it truly means. So um, Mike Boynton yesterday in the, the season opening press conference mentioned, hey, Big 12, unequivocally no doubt the best league in the country obviously the reigning national champion Kansas is uh, is in the league o Oklahoma State will have uh, two chances to knock off the the reigning champions so I think there's enough firepower on this uh, on this team's schedule even with what Ben said a bad non-conference schedule because the Big 12 was so strong to get in and um, the ability to get in will I think certainly help Oklahoma State going forward so here in this last minute or so, I have one quick question for you guys. And going into this season, who do you think is going to be the biggest asset on the Cowboys basketball team? You know, there can be some debate on this one. Yep. But I, I think uh, I think Avery Anderson is going to be that guy for the Cowboys. One of those players Mike Boynton mentioned yesterday is, is going to be relied on to hit threes from the outside. But I also think Avery is going to be important to kind of step up into that leadership void uh, left by Ice Likely transferring to Ohio State, Sam. Um, Avery Anderson is going to be important. Yeah, I'll throw out um, a, a guy that Avery Anderson will pass to a lot, maybe uh, th throw through lobs to Musa Cisse. My point mentioned, hey, in all likelihood, this is probably the last year that this team has Musa because a seven-foot guy like Musa in the middle, um, former five-star kid, NBA teams are dripping. Uh, you know, he's dripping with talent. NBA teams want that guy. Um, but Musa could pair with Caleb Boone to uh, become one of the preeminent shot blockers in the country like he was last year. And I think it'll be a big factor too. Yeah, that's definitely correct. So that's all the time we have to talk about this here on this segment, but make sure to stay with us because after the break, we're gonna take a look at some of Mike Gundy's words on the upcoming Bedlam game and what Bedlam will be like in the future. All next on the Writer's Room. I'm Shauna here at where the Buffalo Roam in beautiful downtown Pawnee, Oklahoma. We have a lot of beautiful and unique items for sale in the store, but our number one items are Navajo jewelry, Pendleton blankets, and Consuela. It's a great place to shop, a beautiful downtown, so come see us in Pawnee, Oklahoma. Pecans are staple to Oklahoma. In fact, many of our native pecans come from trees that are older than Oklahoma statehood. My father's the one that got us started into the pecan picking. I was probably 10 or 12 years old and we started off with uh, one little mechanical picker that you pulled behind a four-wheeler. Then we'd go home at night and we'd clean them on a TV tray. 
I guess uh, watching my dad work hard when we were young and people started trusting him and getting more and more groves, uh, we just kept growing. Being a, a relatively new and fresh company, we get to sit in the same room with people who have been a part of the Oklahoma economy for decades. It's opened a lot of doors. It's gave us uh, quite a bit of exposure and I think people you know, we'll take a small company like us a little more serious. We're just going to continue growing as long as our community lets us and our customers keep on buying, and we'll see where it takes us. <laughs>
um, here, here in a couple of years. So it'll be really interesting to follow. Yeah, and now you're talking about, you just talked about the giant pistol grill that you wrote a story on, I believe, on the Ocali. Yeah. Um, what do those gestures say about OSU fans? Well, it's, um, I'll first preface it with saying, I think you can find these fans everywhere, um, across many universities and schools, but o OSU fans, they, uh, they're dedicated, they're, they're willing to go over the top. Um, I, I think of Dave Himbry, a guy I met who, uh, there was a massive pistol-shaped grill in, in front of his daughter's sorority, and I, um, I knocked, on the, knocked on the door, I'm like, hey man, I'm, I'm trying to find, find the owner of this grill. So, um, j just an example of, of, of one of many OSU fans willing to go over the top, um, make something custom, have a little fun to uh, maybe nag at some OU fans, <laughs> uh, sh show it off and, and flex their state pride. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's all we're going to have time for for this segment, but make sure to stay with us for our next segment here on the Writer's Room. I'm Kristen Hawkins. I went to Oklahoma State University here in Stillwater in 99 to 2004. I've always felt like Stillwater needed more family-friendly things to do, and we have opened up AR Workshop. We do everything from knitting blankets that can be done in a three-hour class, and we create doormats and porch signs, the Christmas wreaths with our yarn that we use for the blankets. We also do, um, we just started a new project for gnomes, and we've done pumpkins during the fall, but our big thing that we do here are interior signs. Our designs are extremely unique to AR Workshop. Customers come in, it's everything is here for them to do. They create everything. They can be as hands-on as they want. They came in here to relax and have fun and that they are proud of their project that they've made. Ace in the Bowl Salsa started many, many years ago. I was trying to find a recipe to take to a family gathering, and so I started messing around with different recipes, and I took a little bit from here and a little bit from there, and I came up with a salsa that is truly unique. Ace in the Bowl Salsa is an olive oil-based salsa with tomatoes, green chilies, green onions, and black olives. There's no sugar added, it's gluten-free, low calorie, low carb, low fat, low sodium. So it's a very, very, very good alternative to any snack you may want. As of right now, I'm just looking to be in Oklahoma and having a successful business within the state. If uh, my grandkids could ever take it over when they're old enough, that would be my dream. We are back for our last segment here on today's episode of the Writer's Room with Ben and Sam. And now we're going to take a look at some Big 12 football from this past weekend. So I'm going to talk to you guys about some scores here. K-State beats OU 41-34, which is huge news for us here in Stillwater. And Texas lost 34-37 to against Texas Tech. What does that say about the Big 12's state right now? What does that say about college football in the Big 12? Yeah, it took just one week of conference matchups to really – throw the entire uh, Big 12 preseason polls and all that out the window and um, re have everyone start reevaluating things. I'll tell you what Mike Gundy said. He, he said th those results, OU obviously uh, a preseason favorite in, in Texas, um, highly ranked in preseason favorite. He said that it just shows that the Big 12 has um, such a high level of parity right now. And Mike Gundy said it, I think that could mean uh, a two or a three win team. Maybe that's the team that, that takes the, the Big 12 this year I personally don't think that an undefeated team will, will win the Big 12 or, you know, even Oklahoma State and Baylor, which I guess emerge as kind of the, the two very early favorites now, now that OU and, and Texas have picked up a loss. I don't really see either of those teams going undefeated throughout all of conference play. So um, I, I think there will be, uh, maybe we get into November and um, there's still nothing decided in terms of the Big 12 race because the parity is all-time all high. Kansas leads the top of the Big 12 right now. So I think <laughs> a lot of these teams are, are bunched up in skill level and there's no uh, one juggernaut going to run this league. Yeah. It does feel like, you know, maybe the Big 12 won't have a college football playoff here this year. But it does really feel like the bottom of the Big 12 is a lot better than it has been in years past. Um, looking at you, Jayhawks. So I, I, think, I think definitely, you know, Sam said it is bunched up in the middle there. 
Um, is that a good thing for the league? I don't know. Is it a bad thing? You know, maybe. Um, I do think it's bringing a lot of smiles to a lot of athletic directors' faces to see Texas and OU both lose in the same week um, as the two teams that are departing for the SEC. I think that, that was just a, a fun little note uh, for a lot of people to follow. Do you think these scores from this past week, I know you said uh, Coach Gundy spoke a little bit about it, but do you think these scores from this past week maybe push OSU's players going to Waco this weekend uh, to do better? Do you think this kind of inspires them? What do you, how do you think this affects them? I, I think the answer is yes to that. And um, players might say no. Players might say, oh, I don't even watch games. I, I'm so locked into what I do. Um, I don't really buy that, to, to, to be quite honest, because when, when you see the door swing open a little bit, obviously it's through one week of, of conference on conference matchups, so um, no door is going to be wide open to this race. But yeah, I, I think you do see in Oklahoma State, for example, your, your uh, in state rival that has perennially uh, beat you out for the league, they stumble a little bit. Texas stumbles. And um, I, I think now this, this game, Oklahoma State versus Baylor on, on Saturday, becomes one of, one of the biggest matchups where I think this game. We could be looking back in, in two months and circling, man, this game was just so important. And um, I, I think that whoever wins on Saturday in Waco will have such a leg up on not only the other team in that matchup, but also on Oklahoma SU. Yes, and we, we talked about it earlier in the show with the men's basketball team. When there's a path to the playoffs and to postseason glory, you know, it is maybe a little bit easier to play and to, to get right for those big matchups, one of which is going to be this Saturday in Waco. Um, yeah, I, I think certainly from an OSU perspective, the path to get back to Arlington in a Big 12 championship in a New Year's Six Bowl is definitely there with, uh, with these matchups earlier um, with those losses. Yeah. So going into this weekend, what do you think is the biggest struggle OSU is going to face against Baylor? Ooh, I, I'm curious to see how Blake Shapin does. Um, a lot of OSU fans are going to remember the, the quarterback who had only started you know, like three games torching him uh, in that Big 12 championship. I really want to see how the Baylor quarterback who has played well thus far this season, um, how he's improved, if he's going to continue to torch, you know, a, an OSU defense that hasn't really faced um, a passing game like the one they're going to face on Saturday. Yeah. So that's all the time we have here in the writer's room today. But thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure to find more of Ben and Sam's work. And, of course, our other writers on the Ocali. Find their work on Ocali.com. And we hope to see you guys next week in the writer's room. chef here at Scratch for two and a half years, uh, started here as a line cook. Our food and drinks are a bit separate entities almost inside the restaurant, so the food is now up to 85% of the uh, products we bring in are raised or grown locally. Uh, it's all based off the things that I grew up eating in southern Oklahoma, the things my grandparents ate. Um, uh, fresh food, clean food, um, organic food, sustainability, that's all of our thing. So front of house to back of house, we're able to maintain both with freshness. But made in Oklahoma means we get it straight from the farms that are 20, 30 minutes, another little county away. We get it straight from them. are when folks drink our water is that they'll drink it for a few days and find out the difference. They'll start feeling better because there's been no chemical in our water. There's a list of good things that we have. We don't have any bad things in it. I see the future of divine water as being worldwide, which will bring outside dollars into the state. It means a lot to me because I started it, I guess, and our family started it. are when folks drink our water is that they'll drink it for a few days and find out the difference. They'll start feeling better because of
everyone, and welcome back to the pregame show. This Saturday, we have an away game, but we're still bringing you the news on the Baylor OSU game. Today, I'm joined by Landon Green. Landon, thanks What's for joining on? us. What's going on? It's good yeah. to be here. It's all, you know, we've been producing this show for a while now, so it's about time I get on camera and start talking about it. So. I think so, too. I mean, um, I'm curious to see how today's game's going to go. I mean, there's kind of a lot to talk about today. We have yeah. a lot of history with Baylor, but just – in general, this season, I mean, we're we're off to a really good start, but it's not necessarily a super competitive start, I would say. Um, give me kind of just your general thoughts on OSU so far this season. Well, so far, I mean, they they've really they've played above expectations in in some aspects. So their offensive line's probably the most solid that they've been in a long time, um, as far as just the games that we've seen. Now mm -hmm. then, like you said, it hasn't been very competitive. They played against Central Michigan. There's not really much adversity there outside of the, the last half where you're already up 35 and you give up 21, and it gets yeah. a little interesting there at the end. Yeah. But um, they still you know, handled that game, got through it. Mm -hmm. They handled Arizona State. They handled a little bit of adversity there. We're able to push through that. And then Arkansas, Pine Bluff, you know, say what you will, but you get to see a little bit of, of what comes through those games, even if it is the 63-7 blowout that we saw. Mm -hmm. We get to see a little bit of the – at least in that first half, we got to see the offensive line sort of move, got to see them move up to that second level, move guys out of the way and give uh, Dominique Richardson and, and Spencer Sanders some time to see what they got in front of them. Mm -hmm. I agree. So we're getting into conference play, and it's our first game on the road. We're coming off a of bye week. Tell me your thoughts on kind of just how you anticipate the game to go just in Waco, first of all. Well, it's going to be interesting. So, I mean, Baylor coming off of a week where, you know, they get a good solid win um, last week, and then they're coming in uh, to this game. So it's one of those where um, – you know, we talk about in the NFL where, you know, you get that, that first bye week in, in the playoffs mm -hmm. and you got to ask yourself, okay, is that rest good or is it bad? Mm -hmm. Are the teams that are going to win that first wild card weekend going to come in ready to go and the other team's going to be lethargic or is the rest good where they're going to come in rested, well rested, the other team's a little banged up, mm -hmm. where they're going to come in and dominate. It's one of mm -hmm. those questions where, you know, how do you come out of the bye week? And I think for OSU, you know, we look we look in the past, they've come out of bye weeks do doing doing just fine. Mm -hmm. they, there's no problems there in their in their bye week mm -hmm. in their bye week processes. So um, when you talk about coming out of the bye week for OSU, Mike Gundy always seems to have his teams ready to go. Um, but Baylor's going to be a tough team. So mm -hmm. you know, coming into this, we'll see what what OSU can come up with. But um, I mean, history tells us that Mike Gundy can come out of a bye week, you know, looking peachy. Yeah, I'm curious to see. I mean, the last time we actually played in Waco, though, was in 2020. It was, I would say, a blowout. 42-3 to three was the final score. And it's tough to play on the road. It's tough to especially play in Waco. Being OSU, this rivalry has grown, especially after this last game that we had in December. Big 12 championships was not in our favor. But with that being said, and with the experience that OSU has thus far and with Baylor, how do you expect OSU to adjust from missing the key players from the championship game last year? Well, I, th I think it all comes down to, you know, the guys that you have, mm -hmm. you know, you have a good core coming back. Mm -hmm. um, the, the defensive front, you got a good core coming back from that defensive front. You got yeah. the Tyler Lacey, you got uh, Brendan Martin, you got uh, Colin Oliver, you get Trace Ford back, who's a, a big time heart player. You know, you talk about, um, you know, just guys coming back from injury and, and playing well. Um, he's a guy that's come back and played played pretty decent this year. And so on the defensive side, that's sort of where you start to line things up and see what you got um, and then kind of move everybody in around those guys. On the offensive side, bringing Spencer Sanders back, you know, we, we talk about, you know, some of the some of his history with Baylor is not very, you know, exciting. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you bring him back, he's a little bit, you know, more mature. Um, we've seen him in the, in the first two games and it doesn't – or the first three games and it doesn't seem like he's doing things – you know, he doesn't seem like he's forcing too much. Yeah. I think in the last three or four years that we've seen him play, he's he seems to want to force things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this year he's really letting the game come to him. He know, he's knowing exactly when he needs to get out of the pocket and use his legs. Mm -hmm. He knows when he needs to, to go out and, and make those passes. He doesn't try to force anything that's not there. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, bringing that back this year, um, you feel a little bit better about your chances coming into this game <coughs> uh, from Baylor. Mm -hmm. I agree. I was – Thinking about this earlier, with the difference in the pace of play between OSU and Baylor, with Baylor being a much slower-tempo team, do you think that's going to have 
a negative effect, a positive effect for OSU, potentially being able to move the game in their control? Well, I think I think it's definitely positive. Uh-huh. I mean, because you, you talk about how quickly they move on offense, right. how quickly they get to the ball, how quickly they snap the ball. Yeah. For Baylor, they're looking over they're looking over at the sideline. Uh-huh. They're going, hey, you know, their, their coaches are doing all their signals, and you got four coaches throwing up their signals, and one guy's telling them to play, and they're all trying to figure it out. The whole time, OSU's right back to the line. Yeah. So really, it forces it forces two things. It forces the coaches to act a little bit faster with their signals, which mm-hmm. can add mistakes, mm-hmm. and it forces the defense to line up quicker, mm-hmm. which also gets them out of spots. Yeah. And so you'll see, you know, you might see Baylor run through a couple of timeouts even in the first quarter just to try to keep up with the tempo from from this OSU offense. So we'll see we'll see how they how Baylor handles it, but I really think that um, it's a positive for OSU to run as fast as they do against a team like Baylor, who you know seems to want to take their time. Mm-hmm. And so as of right now, OSU is number nine in the AP poll. Baylor is at 16 currently. Do you think that that's an accurate representation of this pre-conference play, or do you think that it even matters in today's game, kind of where they stand? Uh, right now, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen in the past where, you know, last week we saw OU lose to Kansas State. Yeah. Um, right now they're, they're down 41-17 at the start of the third quarter, by the way, to TCU. But last year, the last, last week we saw them lose to Kansas State. In the years past, we've seen them lose to Kansas State, and mm-hmm. what have they done? They've made it right back to the college football playoff. Yeah. So I don't think right now losing, if you lose a game right now, I don't think it's, it's going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, but that's also OU. Yeah. We're, we're, OSU is not OU yet. The logo on the side of the helmet is not the logo on the side of the helmet that, yeah. that OU has. So, yeah. you know, I don't think it matters. But also, you know, hey, you're going to have to go out there and win as many games as possible. For Baylor, though, this is definitely a game where they're going to have to come out and play ball because they've already took taken that L uh, to BYU earlier in the year. Mm-hmm. Speaking about the BYU game, I saw in a recent pre- press conference, excuse me, from Dave Aranda, Talking about how really this season, especially, he wants to keep it in, like, the time zone of the game. He's trying not to go into overtime. But that's kind of, I think, maybe where the issues arose in the BYU game. Do you think that OSU is able to keep it a win, potentially, in the game time? Or do you think they might have to extend to overtime? Uh, it depends. I mean, we'll see We'll see how it goes. I mean, y- one, one thing you have to, mm-hmm. to put into perspective, though, is BYU, the elevation. Yeah. So I mean Baylor, you practice all year in the in the in the Texas heat, or yeah. all summer in the Texas heat. You go through your training camp in the Texas heat, and then you hop up in the mountains and see how you play up there. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, I took a trip one time, uh, a recruiting trip to Air Force, mm. and we we had guys from all over the place. I'm from Oklahoma. We have a cat there from Texas. We have a couple guys from Georgia. Those guys from Georgia were not doing well, and we were just walking up a couple flights of steps. Okay. They were they were really trying to catch their breath. So. BYU might might have a little bit of an asterisk next to it as mm-hmm. far as losses go. But I will say, you know, the things that BYU did well are the things that, that OSU are going to have to come in here. They're going to have to control the, the line of scrimmage. They're going to have to be physical. Mm-hmm. They're going to be, be be a little bit faster, you know, that, that tempo that we talked about. And they're going to have to really control how they, how they go about, um, you know, to control your turnovers. Mm-hmm. Um, my final question before we send it to who has the edge. There's been a lot of talk about kind of this game determining – the winner goes to the Big 12 championships. Do you think that that's an accurate thing to say, or do you think it's kind of too early in the season to say really what? I, I think in August, that's a true statement. Uh-huh. I think in August, absolutely. You're looking at OSU Baylor. You're looking at OU Texas. You're looking at all these these different uh, games that are going on around the Big 12. I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh-huh. I think as of right now, I don't think that. I mean, yeah. you got Kansas State playing really good football. You have Texas Tech playing decent football. You have Kansas – undefeated right now I mean the world is topsy-turvy everything's yeah. upside down and we're still trying to figure out what's going on so yeah. I don't think that this is necessarily that game mm-hmm. but I'll have to see a little bit more and a little bit more of a test uh, spot to see how that goes gotcha okay so before we send it over my last question for you is do you think there's any special keys to, the, to today's game do you think there's anything really that OSU needs to focus on tempo be physical at the line of scrimmage and just try to try to stay ahead of the chains. Try to stay, try to keep those mistakes down to a minimum. All right, well, that's going to do it for us, but we're going to send it over to Zach and Devin with Who Has the Edge. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Who Has the Edge. 
I'm Zach Berger. Today I'm joined with Devin Bloomer. Devin, how are you doing today? Eh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's football Saturday. It's always happy to see an OSU game on TV. For sure, for sure. So today on Who Has the Edge, we're going to be talking about Oklahoma State versus Baylor, some Big 12 matchups, and then games across the nation. But first, let's start with, I mean, the reason this show is happening, Oklahoma State versus Baylor. We have a line of two and a half for Baylor, over under for 56. Before we get into specifics of the game, just how do you feel in general? Um, Baylor has a really balanced offense, so if Baylor can just slow down, it can really give OSU some problems. But I think OSU, with their fast tempo offense, can really combat that. Yeah. So first I want to start with who has the edge for the offense, right? We're looking at some some very historic matchups, especially thinking about last year with Spencer Sanders versus Baylor team. I mean, you know, last year, Spencer Sanders, in every game that wasn't versus Baylor, he had... Let me see. He had uh, only six interceptions total for the year. But when facing Baylor twice, he had seven interceptions. So he def definitely has some bad history ver versus this team. And I think he's going to be looking to get some revenge. Yeah, Spencer Sanders should be. He's been doing really good this year. Uh, ten touchdowns on the year, only one interception. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really toned down his interception problem. And I hope he continues to do that with Baylor. Yeah, and then looking on Baylor's side of the ball with quarterback Blake Shapin, you know, I was watching last week, and it seemed like when he had time in the pocket versus Iowa State, he was really able to get that deep ball. So hopefully if our D-line can step up and really create that quarterback pressure, he won't be able to get off those passes. Yeah, and uh, Blake Shapin, he's been sacked eight times this year. Mm -hmm. So they're letting people back there. And if OSU's D-line, they can get back there and maybe make him be quicker on his reads, maybe make some mistakes, that can really hurt not only their passing game, but also hurt their running game a little bit, which Richard Reese is looking really good this year. Yeah. He has 315 yards with six touchdowns, and he's averaging five and a half yards per carry. Yeah, you know, I think both of these defensive have a really good run defense. So I think a key for who has the edge on this matchup will be who does good versus that run game, right? Can Dominic Richardson step up or can Reese step up? Who's going to give that whole offense an opportunity to shine maybe on that deep ball? And if OSU really wants a big shot to win this game, you you got to make um, you got to make Blake Shapin be the deciding factor for Baylor. Of you course. can't let them just keep running the ball over and over again. Because mm -hmm. OSU they play they play their best when they're playing fast. Of course. And if Baylor can slow that down, it's going to throw OSU off a little bit. Yeah, and you know, like Dylan said on the other side, Baylor is has a slower tempo, so hopefully shaking that up a little bit will be good for them. So for who has the edge officially for offense, I think I'm going to give it to OSU. You know, Spencer Sanders is going to be looking for vengeance, have a chip on his shoulder. I'm going to give the edge to OSU. I got to give it to OSU, too. Mm. I think OSU's up-tempo offense is really going to hurt Baylor, and yeah. it's going to really make the game a lot faster. It's something Baylor's not really used to. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. This is going to be a very good matchup offensively. I, next time, you know, we'll talk about defense and, and how this holds up. I think it'll be interesting to see with three weeks now under their belt, how will the secondary for OSU really adapt? So who has the edge? I'm going to give it to OSU, but I think it's going to be who doesn't make the mistake, you know? Yes, that's exactly what you said. Uh, if Spencer starts making mistakes, that's something that will really hurt OSU because Baylor, you know, they have a history of making Spencer make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, Baylor's also allowed less points per game. So if they can just keep OSU down on points and make them play slower, I think Baylor would have the edge. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it's going to be it's going to be good to see defense versus defense, in my opinion, mm -hmm. who, you know, we're in Waco. I, I really want to see Spencer Sanders just take over and take this game in his own hands. Yeah, I hope I hope Spencer goes for like 300 yards and like yeah. five touchdowns. That's what I'm hoping yeah. for. Well, that'll do it for our Oklahoma State versus Baylor matchup. Next, we'll go into some Big 12 games. But for now, let's send it back over to Dylan and Landon. Zach and Devin, great stuff. Thank you guys for your input. I agree completely about a lot of the stuff that you guys said, especially in regards to Spencer Sanders and the fast-paced tempo. We'll talk about that a little bit more in regards to setting up defense and offensively. But when we come back from the break, we're going to be breaking down the OSU defense versus the Baylor offense. So be sure to come back to the pregame show to watch that. My name is James Ramiti. Fired Up Stilly is the name of the business, and I'm one of the owners. We all three met, the three owners, working as employees at a similar place like this. 
What I hope for is for everybody to feel welcome, like family. Not only do I want students to feel welcome to come here and study and use our free Wi-Fi, but also I want adults and families to be able to come in. We've built a connection with a lot of people, and you know, Stillwater is a big community, so we just want to invite everybody to be able to eventually make their way through our doors. Well, definitely the T's, I would say. Most people fall in love with them. They just got a great amount of energy, gets you going through your day, and it just kickstarts you to get you know everything you need to done. For myself, it would just have to be, you know, being the owner, owning something that, you know, is able to impact other people's lives and, you know, the way we can affect our community is something that I really have always wanted to do. We love our clients and our customers that come through every day and we enjoy getting to know them. Hi, I'm Shauna here at Where the Buffalo Roam in beautiful downtown Pawnee, Oklahoma. We have a lot of beautiful and unique items for sale in the store, but our number one items are Navajo jewelry, Pendleton blankets, and Consuela. It's a great place to shop, a beautiful downtown, so come see us in Pawnee, Oklahoma. Welcome back to the pregame show, everyone. Um, so in this segment, we're going to be breaking down the OSU defense. We'll talk a little bit about the Baylor defense, but let's start with general, then we're going to work our way down. Just off the top of your head, how are you feeling about the OSU defense today? I mean, I feel I feel good about the front, the the defensive backfield, mm -hmm. um, the front four, front five, whoever, however they run up there. I feel really good about them. Mm -hmm. uh, Blake Shapin, we've seen, you know, he's he's <coughs> kind of had a little bit of trouble, you know, once he gets out of the pocket trying to figure it out, and they'll be definitely flushing him out of there. Mm -hmm. But once he gets out of there and throws it downfield, how's the secondary going to do? Right. And that's really where where OSU has had its struggles this year mm -hmm. um, in that secondary, which is something that's not new for OSU. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if if anybody remembers the past decade, really the secondary is as good. You know, you might have one or two good guys, but really as a team, they struggled a lot. Mm -hmm. um, now that we've been spoiled the past couple of years with with a few good guys that came in and have really handled everything, but. Um, this year, the secondary is definitely something that we need to watch out for. Baylor's uh, receiver core is is really solid this year. Um, even if their quarterback, I personally, I don't think is is as is up to par as they've had in the past. But mm -hmm. their receiving core is just as good as any they've had. Mm -hmm. Speaking of receiving, they've had Richard Reese and Junior Craig Williams kind of take over those roles. So far, they've combined for 93 carries, 488 yards, and eight touchdowns. But necessarily they haven't had the strongest competition either. I mean, BYU was a tough, tough game for them. But Iowa State, they're good, but I mean, I don't think that they're as good as previous years. Do you see them being a problem for us? Uh, I, the receiving core, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I see, I can see that. And here's the thing, Iowa State, you know, we, they, are, they are down this year mm -hmm. as compared to previous years, but they're still a tough team. It's mm -hmm. still tough to go into Ames and, and win a game. Mm -hmm. So for Baylor to go in there and pull that off, I mean, it was not an easy feat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll still say Iowa State made them make mistakes when they got their, their hands in the face of Shapin and made them mm -hmm. get out of the pocket, made them get creative, and that's where Baylor saw their struggles last week in, yeah. the, in the first half. Now they clean those up coming out of halftime, but if you can continue to get pressure on them and, and on Shapin and see if you can move them out, mm -hmm. then things start to, start to sh shape up for you. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. <laughs> Um, okay, so in the recent press conference Mike Gundy had, he mentioned a lot of missed assignments, kind of, we started off with a lot of problems with our defense in game one against CMU, but gradually throughout each game it's getting less and less, we're getting better and better, of course. How do you think the starting defense is going to do in today's game now, kind of that they haven't had as much experience in the non-conference play? Well, I Really, I mean, non-conference play is going to get them really prepared. So, okay. so it, it got. I think that they definitely improved 
from from each week. Mm -hmm. It's tough to see against Arkansas Pine Bluff, but you really against Arkansas Pine Bluff, what you're looking for is the fundamentals. Yeah. So you're not looking for them to make the play. You're just looking for them to to fill the gaps that they mm -hmm. need to fill and getting in there and and doing just following their assignments. Mm -hmm. So they I think they did that against Arkansas Pine Bluff. I think they 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 definitely played exponentially better against Arizona State than they did against Central Michigan. Um, and Mike Gundy, I think, hit on it a little bit in one of his press conferences where he says, hey, all of our guys on the defensive side are new. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at outside of our defensive front, linebackers, new guys. Yeah. Secondary, some most of them are, are new guys. You mm -hmm. know, you have Jason Taylor and uh, Jabbar Muhammad coming back. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, you're you're kind of teaching these new guys, some of them freshmen even, mm -hmm. how to do it. And then on you add on top of that, Derek Mason being a new coordinator and you're you're introducing new defensive techniques and new defensive styles into something where you know we we had we've had the same defense for the for the past four or five years yeah. so you you've been able to develop those techniques develop that that rapport with your defense and now you introduce a whole new offense or a, new, a whole new system to them and that's sort of what they're learning right now so today's going to be the big test and see how much they've improved we'll see if it, if it works out for them so speaking of Derek Mason we lost Jim Knowles obviously that was a big loss for us the new defensive style that we're playing, I don't know necessarily how much major difference we have so far. Do you think that he's doing a good job with kind of the improvements and just kind of getting our guys in shape for today's game? Yeah, and, and, and really where you see the, the improvements are with, um, with their, their substitutions. So Jim Knowles does a really good job, uh, did a really good job of, of moving guys around, you know, um, getting guys into twist situations where you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're pulling your, your defensive tackle out to the edge and your defensive ends coming around him and, and sort of testing that, that inside mm -hmm. guard and that center and see if they can keep up with it. Mm -hmm. um, he did a really good job with blitzing. This, this defense, what, what it does is, is it, it, it relies on your personnel. Mm -hmm. It relies on everybody. So if you can go three deep, then this defense is gonna do that because really what you're doing is you're hoping that you can put your fast guys on the edge. Yeah. So you got Colin Oliver, Trace Ford, um, um, Tyler Lacey, and you're putting those guys out on the edge. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the Brendan Martin or Brock Martin and uh, Brendan Taylor, you're hoping that they can get in there and cause some cause some mischief on the inside mm -hmm. and just create that stuff and let your linebackers sort of flow wherever they need to. And the mm -hmm. linebackers are pulling back into, into zone and they're sort of, you know, with, with a lot of the mobile quarterbacks that we have now, um, they're dropping back into a spy. So they're kind of mm -hmm. watching the, the quarterback, making sure he doesn't step out of the pocket. But then you have guys up there that are fast and they're getting out on the edge. And so they're moving out there trying to get those sacks and getting up in the, in the in a, getting some pressure on the quarterback. Okay, so we talked about some returners, especially let's talk about Mason Cobb. He's kind of taken over as that defensive leader. He right now is leading tackler with eight per game, and he ranks number one in the Big 12 and six in the FBS with two tackles per loss, per loss per game. Are you expecting him to be the standout in today's game, or do you think someone else is going to take over that role? Uh, I think so. I think I think he's a guy that's definitely going to move around the field. Mm -hmm. um, you needed somebody to kind of step up into that role that Malcolm Rodriguez left, that, mm -hmm. that gap that he left. Yeah. Um, and is he Malcolm Rodriguez? No. But he does do a really good job of moving around the field. He fits into his assignments, knows where he needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so he does a good job there. Um, I think he's definitely going to be a key to this game, along mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, Tyler Lacey and all those guys as well. Mm -hmm. So we had Trace Ford out last year, but he's back this year. And he's done well. He's done extremely well, especially coming off an injury that he had. Do you see him kind of joining Mason Cobb and being a defensive leader? Or do you think he's kind of going to take a – the back seat. Uh, I think right now, I think he's definitely, he has the most tenure out mm -hmm. of anybody right now. So um, he was the, you know, early starter uh, on that defensive front, mm -hmm. I think. So um, you're definitely going to see him kind of step into the leadership role. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to necessarily be the the vocal leader or the, the physical leader that you're going to see. He's going to mm -hmm. be more of the in the huddle guy mm -hmm. and, and showing guys techniques. You have to give him a little bit. Coming mm -hmm. off of ACL injury is difficult. Yeah. I tore my meniscus and that was just a meniscus and it took me six months to come yeah. back from that. So, you know, digging in there, you know, coming back from those things, I think you give him a year and he's definitely going to step into that physical leadership role. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be about all the defenses today. It's just kind of how it's going to go. OSU is a very strong run defense. Baylor is also a very strong run defense. Who do you think, as of right now, is more prepared for this game? 
I think I think probably Baylor at this at this point just because they didn't have that bye week last mm-hmm. week. Um, I think that they they took the loss. They saw what they needed to fix. Obviously, you're not going to learn a lot from Texas State, but mm-hmm. I will tell you what, Iowa State's going to be the one where you're going to learn a lot from. They went into Ames and they seem to handle business. Mm-hmm. I know. I, I'm curious to see kind of just the the morale of the game and kind of see how our team just approaches this, what their mental state's going to be, and if they're kind of coming into it with like a this is like a revenge game from the Big 12 championship or if they're, it's just another game. So do you anticipate OSU to be amped and ready to go or do you kind of um, assume them to come in more neutral and just it's any other game? I, I hope not. I uh-huh. hope they come in even keel. I hope mm-hmm. they don't come in you know, thinking, oh, this is going to be our revenge game. Because guess what? I've seen plenty of revenge games pop out mm-hmm. and guys fizzle out by the first half. So hopefully they can keep it together, hang in there, and just keep it even keel the whole game. Yeah. All right, well, that's going to do it on our defensive segment for the pregame show, but we're going to send it over to Zach and Devin for Who Has the Edge. Welcome back to Who Has the Edge. So last segment, we talked OSU and Baylor. Now let's keep it in the conference, but talk about some other Big 12 games. Devin, we got two games going on, two later today. First off, we got Kansas State versus Texas Tech. And so Kansas State is up 30 to 20 right now. Adrian Martinez remaining hot just as last week. All three of their touchdowns, he has scored. 105 passing yards with a passing touchdown and 156 rushing yards himself with two touchdowns. How are we feeling about that? Man, Kansas State's looking good. Uh, just coming off their week where they beat OU, uh, just this their first game ranked, and right. they've proven why they deserve to be ranked. Yeah, you know, I thought maybe there was a falter with the two-lane game, but they sure proved everyone wrong with that OU game last week. And, mm-hmm. man, Martinez might be something to worry about come later in the year. Next up, and <laughs> I don't know if I'm reading this right, <laughs> TCU versus OU. TCU is up 48-17 to 17 right now. What? what? That is crazy. Nobody expected this. And <laughs> – just OU getting blown out like this, you don't really you don't really see this. And then on top of that, this be their second loss in a row. It's something you really don't see from OU also. Yeah, My question y- is, do you think they'll be unranked after this game? And they got to be. I mean, they have to be. They're ranked 18th right now. I just – usually you go into these games, okay, we lost, but let's move past that, right? And TCU is putting it to him. Quarterback Matt Duggan, 20 for 30, 283 yards and three touchdowns. And running back Kay Miller – 12 carries, 131 yards, two touchdowns. They're just putting it to them offensively. Man, it's just OU, they've been struggling. Yeah. Right? They were struggling against that Kansas State game. Kansas State controlled that entire game, and now they're struggling against TCU. Yeah. They're getting blown out by TCU. So I wouldn't be surprised if they fall outside the top 25, and if Kansas wins their game later today, there will be – probably four ranked Big 12 teams, and OU won't be one of them. Yeah, and reminder, TCU is still undefeated. Mm -hmm. They're 3-0. So with them being undefeated, Kansas also being undefeated, like you said, we could see some multiple teams being the AP poll. I mean, TCU is its one of those games where you're showing, okay, we're not ranked, but let me show you why we should be ranked. And they're surely doing that right now. Yeah, TCU is one of those quiet undefeated teams. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people know they're undefeated, but they – They've been putting it on this season. Yeah. So that's TCU and OU. But a game going on later today at 2.30, same as the OSU game, is Iowa State versus Kansas. And this is this is an interesting game. Tell me about it. I see I see Kansas winning it. Mm. Uh, their quarterback, Jalen Daniels, he leads FBS with a QBR of 98, yeah. which is insane. That's and Kansas is 4-0, which is a crazy start, which I think is their best start since, like, mm. 2009. Yeah, and they beat an undefeated Duke team 35-27 last week. Mm -hmm. They're looking good. Yeah, we talked about TCU wanting to prove themselves. I think Kansas is in that same boat. They're not ranked still, but they're going to show after this week why they want to be ranked. Iowa State coming off a tough loss to Baylor, but Kansas is red hot. They're having fun. Jalen Davis is that guy. Jalen Davis has been looking amazing. And Kansas, they're put at that 26 spot. They have the most votes to receive to come into Mm -hmm. the top 25. So a win here basically guarantees their spot inside the top 25, especially with OU potentially dropping out. Yeah, and so our last game in the Big 12 is West Virginia versus UT. How are you feeling about this game? Texas should win that game. They should. B. John Robinson, he's a beast. Uh, NFL scouts are looking at him immensely. He has 414 rushing yards on the season already, averaging six yards a carry. Mm. That is crazy numbers from a starting running back. Yeah, Bijan, he, he's putting this team on the back, and when you have guys like Quinn Edwards go down and Hudson Card have to step up, 
yeah, Bijan is the guy to say, well, now it's my turn to show my leadership. And I agree, UT's favored by seven, but I, I think they should have this game in the bag. Yeah, West Virginia, they're on a two-game win streak. Mm -hmm. Not big wins, but they did beat Virginia Tech last week, 33-10. to 10. You know, West Virginia do have their uh, close losses. They lost to Pitt, 31-38, and then they went to OT with Kansas, which Kansas has been red hot. So you, yeah. could, you could say West Virginia lost to some pretty good teams. Yeah, no, for sure. It, all good games this week, and, man, we could be seeing two more teams in the top 25 from the Big 12, plus OU dropping out. TCU, Kansas really, really showing why the Big 12 is going to be fun this year. Yeah, the Big 12 looks really good all around. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait for the rest of these games. We'll keep updating you on Kansas State, Texas Tech, and TCU, OU, and great Big 12 games all around this week. All right, we're going to send it back over to the desk to Dylan and Emma. Guys, how are we doing? Well, that was some great stuff. You know, I'm just, honestly, this year, especially this weekend, we're having just some crazy, crazy, crazy games, crazy outcomes. I know we had the Texas Tech, Texas game last weekend, the OU game last weekend, and now the OU game again this weekend. I don't really know what's going on. So. It's, it's a wild. I'm telling you, the Big 12 is wild this year. It, yeah. it, it is truly the upside down. Shout out to Stranger Things. <laughs> um, but we're going to send it to commercial. But before we do that, be sure to come back to the pregame show. We're going to be talking some offense breakdown when we come back. So be sure to tune in. Cannibal salsa started many, many years ago. I was trying to find a recipe to take to a family gathering, and so I started messing around with different recipes, and I took a little bit from here and a little bit from there, and I came up with a salsa that is truly unique. Ace in the Bowl Salsa is an olive oil-based salsa with tomatoes, green chilies, green onions, and black olives. There's no sugar added, it's gluten-free, low calorie, low carb, low fat, low sodium. So it's a very, very, very good alternative to any snack you may want. As of right now, I'm just looking to be in Oklahoma and having a successful business within the state. If uh, my grandkids could ever take it over when they're old enough, that would be my dream. Our state is one of the most beautiful and unique states in the USA. With diverse geographies, the historic Route 66, unforgettable restaurants, and some of the greatest people on the planet. With so much to see and so much to do, living in Oklahoma means one of the best vacation spots is right in our own backyard. Doesn't this story need to be told? As filmmakers and photographers based right here in Oklahoma, we thought so. And hey, who doesn't like a good road trip? So, we packed up our cameras, teamed up with Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell and the Oklahoma Tourism and Recreation Department, and that's how this series was born. We want to show you why traveling within the great state of Oklahoma is a great idea. So come join us for thousands of miles over the next year, from Broken Bow to Black Mesa. This is the Oklahoma Road Trip. My name is Kayla. I've been here since the beginning, so four years. Scratch is more focused on farm and mostly made in Oklahoma products, keeping it local. Sustainability is our biggest thing. Um, that's one of the reasons why this place opened. I've been the chef here at Scratch for two and a half years. I started here as a line cook. Our food and drinks are a bit separate entities almost inside the restaurant. So the food is now up to 85% of the uh, products we bring in are raised or grown locally. Uh, it's all based off the things that I grew up eating in southern Oklahoma, the things my grandparents ate. I'm not, uh, fresh food, clean food, um, organic food, sustainability, that's all of our thing. From front of house to back of house, we're able to maintain both with freshness. But made in Oklahoma means we get it straight from the farms that are 20, 30 minutes, another little county away. We get it straight from them. Welcome back to the pregame show. On this segment, we're going to be breaking down the OSU offense. Got a lot of fun stuff to talk about, a lot to talk about in general. Landon, where should we start? Do we want to go general to specifics, or do you want to just whatever? Let, let's let's start with the, the elephant in the room, Spencer Sanders. How's he going to play today? Seven interceptions in the, in the last two games against Baylor. I How's know. he going to come out this time? Well, I'm just – 
I'm so torn, you know, because I'm like, he gave up four in the championship game. He gave up three in the conference game, but he's only given up one so far this season. But then again, it's no one is Baylor that we've played so far. And I'm, it's going to be tough because I think that he favors the run game personally, but this is going to need to be a passing game. Yeah. And so just with the, the skill of the Baylor defense, it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy for him to get his own big plays. Yeah, it's definitely going to be tough for him. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, we talk about Siaki Ika, mm -hmm. you know, a lot this week. We, yeah. You know, just, just in, in conversation with everybody. <laughs> yeah. They're like, they got, that guy's huge. I mean, what did he say? 6'4", 325, I think is. 358. 358? Yeah. Goodness <laughs> gracious. Goodness gracious. That's a, that's a large human being. So, yeah. you got to control him a little bit, but then once you get there, that secondary for Baylor's really good. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you talk about those seven interceptions from last year. The common theme, though, was that there was pressure on, on Spencer Sanders. He's mm. get, he has a guy in his face. He's getting uh, a hand in his face, or he's getting brought yeah. to the ground, or somebody's wrapped around his waist. And so yeah. um, that offensive line's really going to have to step up. We talk about, you know, they've they've done what they need to do this year. They, they've, they've played solid. Now they have to do that against Baylor, and a tough, a really tough front from Baylor as well. And I'm curious to see if Sanders is ready for this game. I'm curious to see if he hasn't had – a tough competition so far. I feel like he, out of everybody on the field, has had the best performances, but I think it's because, like you said, he had the least amount of pressure on him. So I think that if their defense can break through and get to him, if he can keep his head in the game and move past it, or if he's going to get caught up in whatever's going on and kind of, I don't, I don't know how to put it into the words, but basically he's not going to, he's going to get focused on that and not on how he's playing. Yeah, and I think I think really, you know, it's a matter of of, you know, Casey Dunn kind of growing with Spencer Sanders as mm -hmm. well. So Casey Dunn, he comes in, he's the offensive coordinator in Spencer Sanders first yeah. year and we get we see the plays that he that he calls and they're just a little stale. And that's not that's not anything toward him. Yeah. He's a new offensive coordinator. He's mm -hmm. trying to figure out everybody. He's trying to figure out his personnel. He's trying to figure out how to how to call plays. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the playbook sort of grow as Spencer Sanders grows. We see the playbook grow a little bit. Right. And I think this year we've seen it quite a bit with um, in in the first three games where we've seen some creativity. We've seen mm -hmm. the flea flicker. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a, a, a what, what we call the naked boot, where you know it, it's a boot boot shake. You let it go. You roll the other way, uh -huh. and there's a guy running out the other way that I mean he's completely open. Mm -hmm. and so we've seen that creativity sort of come out this year. And and really, uh, uh, Casey Dunn's done a good job of simplifying the game for Spencer Sanders, I think. Mm -hmm. I think last year they tried to they tried to implement a lot of um, a lot of tough techniques for him. Um, but this year you definitely see the simplification of the offense. I, I want to comment on that a little bit more, too. I think that the simpler the better, especially in a big game like this. Something that I had talked about earlier with some people as well was – Baylor makes good plays, but they make simple plays. They don't really kind of do anything crazy, anything extravagant. And I think that that's why they have such a um, successful offense. But I'm curious if OSU is going to be okay with that. Like, I'm curious if they're going to be able to kind of stick to the basics today or if they're going to want to kind of do the most and kind of show off, like, look, we're better. I, I don't think it's necessarily a show off moment. I think really what they need to do is they need to they need to go out and and just control the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. They need to go out, get Siaki Ika out of the way, mm -hmm. c control the run game, right. and then you can introduce some passing lanes. I think last year, you know, OSU had to rely on the pass against Baylor. Yeah. They had to yeah. rely on the pass to open up everything else because the run game was so closed down. Yeah. So this year what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get around, move guys out of the way, and see if you can clear those guys out mm -hmm. uh, uh, correctly. And then maybe those passing lanes will start to open up. Mm -hmm. But if you do it backward, you try to just pass pass it the whole time that's where you start to get into trouble and that's where we saw a lot of those interceptions pop up okay so three guys that we've seen a lot of success out of are Dominic Richardson Braden Johnson and Brennan Presley do you foresee them having a big impact in today's game or do you think that they're kind of just gonna stay within the crowd and no one's really gonna be like a standout I think they have to be impactful they have they have to go out of their way to, to make sure that they 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 make the plays. Mm -hmm. They they can't have any drops. That, that's one thing that Brendan Presley's had these past three games is that we talk about improvement of the team. Brendan Presley's had a lot of drops, mm -hmm. and and it's not just in the in the slant game. It's in screen passes, a mm -hmm. swing a swing route out to the out to the boundary yeah. and an easy pass. He's wide open, and he's yeah. so worried about what's going on in front of him, he just drops the pass. Mm -hmm. So focusing in, making sure you secure the catch because once he gets it. 
nobody's going to keep up with him. He's mm-hmm. the fastest guy in the Big 12 probably. Yeah. So he's just got to focus in, bring those things in, um, and see what he can do. Dominique Richardson, his play is going to be dependent on the offensive line, really, mm-hmm. today. I think really, more than anything, his, his play is going to be dependent on can you create gaps – once you get those gaps, can you move up to the linebackers, clear those guys out, mm-hmm. and get him one-on-one with the safety? Because he's big enough. Once you get him one-on-one with the safety, we saw those highlights in the intro before the game. Mm-hmm. He'll run you over. Yeah. He'll run through you. So if you get him one-on-one with those safeties, see if you can make some things happen and some things open up maybe downfield. Okay, so as of right now, OSU has a total of 524 rushing yards gained and a total of three hundred or yeah, 348 total passing yards average per game do you think that we're going to be able to hit those numbers today or do you think it's going to be a lot less i I don't think we're going to hit those numbers Mm. i I just don't i mean uh, you you talk about averages and you you add in the the arkansas pine bluff game yeah yeah. the averages start to get a little skewed so we'll we'll definitely see them take a step back from those averages Mm -hmm. but i think it'll still be pretty close I i still think osu's offense is good enough that they can make some things happen and get it i think they can get their passing yards up above 300 this today um, someone that we haven't talked about too much, we mentioned him once, was John Paul Richardson. He's really kind of shown out this year. I think that he's he's taken up that role. He's an upperclassman now, I believe. Um, do you think that he's going to be able to kind of make a name for himself in today's game? Yeah, uh, so so John Paul Richardson is an interesting case. So he's not going to be your big time, mm-hmm. you know, he's not going to be the Braden Johnson. He's not going to be the Tay Martin. He's not going to be the James Washington. Yeah. But what he does get you, he gets you first downs. Mm-hmm. He's he, he, he knows exactly where he needs to be on the field. He, he's great in space. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he know, he's, he's got great field presence. Mm-hmm. And so what he does well is, is he knows exactly where the first down mark is. If you're in third and long, you know, second and long, things like that, get him to the first down marker, and then once he gets it, we've seen that he's a sure catcher. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's going to do it, fortunately, for our offensive breakdown, but we're going to send it over to Zach and Devin once again for Who Has the Edge. Welcome back to Who Has the Edge. Tend it off, we're going to talk about some national games around the league and the AP poll top 25. So we have three games currently going on, almost about to end, actually. We have number seven, Kentucky, versus number 14, Ole Miss. That game's 22 to 19, Ole Miss. We're about less than two minutes left, and Kentucky has the ball halfway through the on the field. Yeah, uh, I had Kentucky winning this game going into it, but Ole Miss, they, they've been playing pretty good. Uh, Kentucky's had his little it's time to shine, yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying, jumping a couple people I, I don't agree with. But Kentucky, they look good, Yeah. but it's proven that they shouldn't be ranked this high. Yeah, it's going to come down to these final moments, see what happens. And then Michigan versus Iowa. Michigan's currently up 27 to 7 versus Iowa, just kind of dominating this game with about a minute left. It's not that big a th- surprise. Yeah. Uh, Michigan's a good football team. You know, they were good last year, they're good this year. Iowa's been kind of on the edge the last couple of years. Uh, I was not surprised to see Michigan up 20. Yeah. And then the last game currently going on is Oregon State's at number 12, Utah. Utah, once again, dominating this game 21 7. They're still early in that game, though, so we could see. Could see what could happen. Hey, Utah, they look they look good. Yeah. Uh, them and USC in the Pac-12, that's going to be a good game when they play. Very much, very much so. So some games to come. At 2.30, we have number 22, Wake Forest, versus number 23, Florida State. Florida State's actually favored by six this game. How do, how do you feel about that game? I think Wake Forest can pull it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had that close game with Clemson. Yeah. And um, – I, I just I really believe Wake Forest can really pull out a win against Florida State. Yeah, I think usually Wake Forest is looked at for their defense, but they they showed that they can score points versus top top defenses themselves with Sam Hartman. So I do agree. I, I think Wake Forest should come out on top this game. Next, also at two thirty, we have number two Alabama versus number twenty Arkansas. Bama, seventeen point favor. How do you feel about that one? Bama should win the game. Mm-hmm. They really should. Yeah. Uh, Bama's always. You know what I'm saying? Running through the SEC somewhat. Recent years, Georgia has been has been up there. But the way Bama played against Texas, how they really struggled yeah, against a Texas team that did lose their starting quarterback during that game, Arkansas could pull out a win. They, they, they could sneak it out. Yeah, I think if Arkansas really grinds their run game, they should be able to, they should be able to compete at least in this game, and we'll see where that goes from there. If Arkansas can just control the game mm-hmm. and don't let Bama and Bryce Young just run wild, yeah, they can win that game. Next at 3 p.m., we have number 17 A&M taking on Mississippi State, and this is a big SEC rivalry game. Yes, uh, I have A&M. Yeah. Uh, A&M, they're always ranked pretty high going into the year because they usually have a top recruiting class, but they haven't really been able to correlate that into winning an SEC title or even being up there with a playoff. 
Yeah, and very interesting. Mississippi State actually favored by four, so th that's going to be a good game to see where it goes. And our last big game to talk about, 6-30, 10 NC State versus number five Clemson. That's a big game. That's a big that's a game. That's a big game. That can go either way. Yeah. Uh, Clemson, DJ looks good. DJ looks good. Clemson very does good. look good. They had that close game with Wake Forest. Mm. It was very close. Uh, NC State, um, they played Texas Tech earlier in the year. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, took care of business. I'm going to go Clemson. I'm yeah, going to go Clemson. Yeah, listen, Devin Leary, he's a good quarterback. They run a very sound team, so I think it'll be interesting to see. Can Clemson just play their game? And if so, they should come out on top. And so lastly, let's talk about the AP poll in general. Some things have been moving around. Very interesting to happen so far. The first thing I want to talk about OSU getting jumped by Tennessee and Kentucky. Yeah, it didn't it didn't really make any sense to me. No. OSU did have their bye week and then Tennessee did come out with a win. So that jumping them is not too big of a surprise, but yeah. the real big surprise was when Kentucky jumped OSU when they both came out with big wins. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's it's interesting, especially us coming off a of bye week, but I, I, I feel like we should have stayed at least with Kentucky. And then next, something very interesting, Kansas didn't get ranked, and they were uh, voted top, but they didn't get ranked. I think Kansas should have been ranked, yeah. me personally. Uh, Kansas State sneaked in because of their uh, win against OU, which they'll probably go up. Uh, Kansas should definitely be ranked. Uh, if they beat Iowa State, they'll definitely get into that ranking. For sure, for sure. Something also interesting at the top of the AP poll is people are wondering with Bama's couple shaky games, at least versus UT, should Ohio State be on top of them in their ranking? I think so. Yeah. Uh, Alabama was really shaky against Texas, and mm -hmm. Ohio State's been performing really good. Yeah, uh, They look like like the best team in the country. Uh, yeah. Georgia had a little bit of struggle last week with their game. Uh, not too much, but just so not the normal domination we usually see out of Georgia. Yeah. Well, that'll do it for Who Has the Edge today. We'll send it back to Dylan and Landon. Thank you, guys. I'm following these games that you're talking about right now, and I just have to say I am so excited. I am a diehard Ole Miss fan, and this is just really just the cherry on top for me. But back to back to OSU Baylor. Before we head to commercial, I just want to give you guys a heads up. We're going to be talking some banger busts in the next segment, so don't miss out on the fun. Be sure to tune back in after this. I'm Kristen Hawkins. I went to Oklahoma State University here in Stillwater in 99 to 2004. I've always felt like Stillwater needed more family-friendly things to do, and we have opened up AR Workshop. We do everything from knitting blankets that can be done in a three-hour class, and we create doormats and porch signs. The Christmas wreaths with our yarn that we use for the blankets. We also do, um, we just started a new project for gnomes and we've done pumpkins during the fall. But our big thing that we do here are interior signs. Our designs are extremely unique to AR Workshop. Customers come in, it's everything is here for them to do. They create everything. They can be as hands-on as they want. They came in here to relax and have fun and that they are proud of their project that they've made. We would design something, it would sit on the counter, and people was either, if enough of them said, you know, this just is, this isn't it, it never made to the line. Dad was excited that they're all original, they were all designed on mom's kitchen table, and it gets in your blood after a while. We're very happy that Pamela and Michael have taken over the business and kept the family going. We took the business over in 2017. When we found that it was available, we wanted to keep the legacy of family alive, but it was also incredible products that deserve to be uh, a part of Made in Oklahoma's story. We were a part of Made in Oklahoma years ago, and so it kind of grew as Made in Oklahoma grew. Oklahoma is ingrained into our, everything that we did. We've been here most of our life. That's what we entailed our whole business on was the Oklahoma homegrown feeling. My name is James Ramiti. Fired Up Stilly is the name of the business and I'm one of the owners. We all three met the three owners working as employees at a similar place like this. What I hope for is for everybody to feel welcome, like family. Not only do I want students to feel welcome to come here and study and use our free Wi-Fi, but also I want adults and families to be able to come in. We've built a connection with a lot of people, and you know, 
Stillwater is a big community, so we just want to invite everybody to be able to eventually make their way through our doors. Well, definitely the T's, I would say. Most people fall in love with them. They just got a great amount of energy, gets you going through your day, and it just kickstarts you to get you know, everything you need to done. For myself, it would just have to be, you know, being the owner, owning something that, you know, is able to impact other people's lives, and, you know, the way we can affect our community is something that I really have always wanted to do. We love our clients and our customers that come through every day, and we enjoy getting to know them. Welcome back to the pregame show. Our final segment. We got some fun stuff for you guys. Um, Banger Bus, you want to just jump into it? Or we got any comments we want to add right before? Okay, Let's do it. No hey, OU before. right now, they, they just scored, so they're going to make this a game down 55 20 board. It's 11 and a half. It's, it's getting board. close. It's <laughs> <laughs> hey, my guy Max back there, he's, he knows. He knows. What he knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good weekend for TCU family, as I have to say that. At Kansas State, TCU. Unfortunately, I told you guys, I had a coach who used to come in with, with peanuts you know, after the weekends so that OU would lose, and he'd feed all the OU, OU kids, hey, I know you didn't eat this weekend, so <laughs> <laughs> you probably got neglected because your team lost, so <laughs> it's not looking good right now. No, no, it's not it looking good. Not. Brent Venable's going to have to go talk to, the, to Joe C. and see what's going on. Um, okay, so Banger Bus started off, defense gets three or more sacks. Someone Let you guys take it. Um, I'll say yes. You know, you mentioned earlier Baylor has allowed, you said, eight sacks eight already. Sacks. Uh, I really like our D-line right now. I, I like Ford. I like Brock. I, You know, I like all these guys, Colin Oliver, Cobb off the edge sometimes even. I, I think we can do it. I, I feel like we're going to be bringing the pressure. And, yeah, first conference game. I could see it happening. I'm, I got to say bang, too. Yeah. Uh, I see Colin Oliver getting two himself. Mm. Um, but three-plus sacks, I think OSU can do it easily. Then what do you got? I'm, I'm a – jump with you guys. I'm going to say, yeah, I think that it's possible. I think that it could be a tough at the start to kind of get going for us, but I think that once we kind of get into a rhythm, I think that it's totally possible. Yeah, definitely. I mean, three plus sacks, that's that's not difficult for this defense to get. Mm -hmm. Defensive line doing a really good job this year, and then, you know, when you implement the blitz a little bit, they let those guys kind of flow back there as linebackers. A lot of things can happen. So, you know what I'm going to go with? More bang. <laughs> bang. <laughs> More bang. Bang it. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. <laughs> <laughs> go folks go folks always um okay number two we have a long history with this question so i'm curious what your guys thoughts are sanders gets intercepted twice i i'll i'll have faith i'll have faith i'll say no it's gonna bust did he okay. throw seven interceptions versus him last year maybe but you know what he has one so far in three games he's looking good He's going to go in there locked in. I'll, I'll say it's a bust. That was last year, you know. We're, yeah. we're a new team. Yeah. We're new Spencer Sanders. He's coming out on top this year. I would say bust. I don't think it's going to be two times. I'm crossing my fingers it's not two times, but I'm going to go with my gut, and I'm going to say he, it's not going to happen. I'm going to say I, bust. I think at this point, I think this question is just a reverse jinx. I was <laughs> <laughs> hoping if we ask it enough, he just won't he throw just any won't, yeah, interceptions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, um, I don't know. I think he, I think he probably throws at least two. I think, he probably, I think he throws at least two, so I'm, I'm going to go with the bang on this one as well. And think he, I, I, I think he's going to do it. I think he throws at least two as well. He has, he has only thrown one interception this season, but we also had some drop picks and some could have been picks. Um, and then he has a bad history with Baylor. So I think it just maybe get to his head a little bit, but not too much. Like two is the max. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Break it down. You know, you look at all the games that, that Spencer Sanders has had over the past years with the losses and everything, how many interceptions he's thrown in those losses. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I don't think they've ever been out of a game. He, he, he may throw six interceptions in the game, but guess what? They're going to be down by a touchdown at the end, yeah. and they're going to be on the one-yard line about to <laughs> yeah. tie the game up. You just don't know. So, I mean, he may throw six interceptions, but he may throw seven touchdowns. You just never know. <laughs> uh, question number three. Sanders gets 250 passing yards. It's, it's going to be a heavy passing game out of him. Do you guys think that that's possible? Yeah, I'll say yes. I, I was saying it earlier. <laughs> Spencer Sanders, he's going in there. He's saying, this is my game for vengeance. This is his revenge game. He's going to go out there with the mindset that he needs to carry it. This is Heisman game? This is this is his Heisman <laughs> game. This is it. This is it. But, yeah, I think he's going to hit it. I, I think I think Baylor has a good uh, run defense, so I think they'll be able to hold Dominic Richardson a little bit, and he'll, he'll show it with his arm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say I 
think that he can do it as long as he keeps it simple. I don't think that we need to be going crazy. I don't think we need to be trying to do too much fancy stuff with the ball. I think we play safe and we play smart, and I definitely think that that's accomplishable. Yeah, I'm going to push it a step further. I think he gets 300 yards. I think he gets 300-plus okay. yards. Yeah, I think I think he has a good game ahead of him. I think he's a guy, you know, even if he does have the turnovers, you know, we've seen it where he's had a lot of turnovers and he's able to push it over 400 sometimes. So okay. I think he pushes up with the, up to 300 tonight or today, and we'll see if he better, if he accomplishes that. Yeah, I'm not sure about 300, but definitely 250. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll have to go bang for 250. Uh, like you said, Baylor does have a good rushing defense. They've only they're only allowing 79 and a half rushing yards per game. Mm -hmm. So if we want to win, Spencer's got to step up and carry the ball. Last question. Are you guys ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Richardson gets two touchdowns. I personally don't really know yet. I'm kind of in debates. I think that I think that it's a possibility, and I think that we have a good chance. Come on, Dominique it. Richardson. He's not Dominique him. Richardson. Yeah. Yes. Dominique Richardson. Yes, okay. yes. I think it's a good chance that we get it. I just hope that. I just hope we play smart today. I'm a little worried that if something goes wrong, Sanders has a tendency to get in his head. I'm just hoping that we play smart, we play safe, and we can get it done. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna go bust. I, I don't think Richardson will get it. I think uh, I, I see. You know, I talked about Spencer having this game. I see almost that K State Adrian Martinez mindset, making Sanders make those plays, and I see him using his legs a lot too in this game. And uh, yeah, I, I I don't know if Richardson will get two. I think he'll get one, but I'm not sure about two. What do you think, Devin? I'm gonna have to go bust. Also, uh, I see Spencer having the majority of the touchdowns this game because we're gonna need him using his arm. Uh, Dominique could possibly get one. I see him getting one, but mm. I'm going to say bust on two. Okay. I'll, I'll bust it as well. Um, the rush defense from Baylor is really good this year. Um, I think if you do get into a short yardage situation on the goal line, um, we saw, unfortunately <laughs> saw it last year. Um, I don't know if OU could punch it in. So I think that they're definitely going to implement the option a little bit. And I think in that game, you start to see Nixon go out there a little bit. You start to see Ollie Gordon go out there and sort of run that rather than Richardson running out there. And so you get that going get some things going down there on the goal line, and you never know what happens. We have a sold-out game in Waco today, you guys. Or the orange is going to be there, and it's going to be it's going to be hot. As like, I mean, as of Wednesday, they did not have they did not have the sellout going. Mm -hmm. They bumped their tickets down, their visiting tickets down to fifty percent off. And guess what? All of a sudden on Friday they have it. <laughs> so yeah, it's gonna be ninety percent orange. They can run those gold jerseys out there before the game. RG three with his legs and everything's gonna show off his track speed. I don't care. It's gonna be a quarter or three quarters orange out there. It's gonna be a big game for OSU. I think it's gonna look like a home game. Yeah. I know. I'm curious to see how it goes. Do you think that there's gonna be a strong energy in that stadium? Or you think it's kind of gonna be a little calm? Do you think people are a little nervous, or do you think they're gonna be pumped up? I think it's gonna be tense. I, I mean, you're talking you're talking the re the the revenge game for the Big <laughs> yeah. Twelve Championship. Yeah. They're gonna be real tense going in there. And also, both of these teams, you don't really know what OSU is bringing to the table. Um, Baylor coming in with a loss, you know, from from BYU, but they've come back with, with two straight wins. You know, you're looking at these teams and going, hey, maybe this is kind of their crossroad right now in, in this in this season. So. I think everybody's going to be real tense. I yeah. think even Mike Gundy might be a little quiet <laughs> in the first yeah. half. Yeah. So, we'll see. Okay, so we got a little under a minute left. You guys want to give your final score predictions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going 27-24 <laughs> Oklahoma State. Uh, okay. I see Oklahoma State getting the go-ahead field goal and making a big stop. I'll go 28-24. I, I think it's going to almost end like last year's Bedlam. I think our D-line is going to come up with a big stop to end it off. I'm, I'm with you, Devin. I think it's going to come down to a field goal. I'm saying 24-21 OSU. I think it's going to be a tight game, and I think it's going to be like in the last couple minutes that it really does does the, I, the final. I'm not as impressed with, with Baylor's defense or Baylor's offense. I think OSU comes out here and gets a 35-21 dub. Okay. Wow, oh you're, you're the highest, yeah. you're the highest hey, score I for us that's today. that's what it is. I know I was a little anxious. I was like, I, I was looking online at the um, lines and everything. I didn't, I was worried to put it in the above the 30s, above the 20s. <laughs> so, I don't know. We'll see. But that's going to do it for our show today on the pregame show. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. And then we'll see you back here in Stillwater next weekend. <laughs>
I'm Amanda Akins. I'm the owner of Hurricane Dixie Leather. I started this company back in about 2015, and I think that one of the most unique things about our store is that we're not just your everyday mom and pop leather shop. We use a lot of color and unique techniques that set us apart from others. We are a full Wrangler retailer. We have lots of Wrangler jeans and shirts. We've also got some other fun boutique clothes and everything, all the leather goods in the store are made here in the shop. We also accept custom orders. Our state is one of the most beautiful and unique states in the USA. With diverse geographies, the historic Route 66, unforgettable restaurants, and some of the greatest people on the planet. With so much to see and so much to do, living in Oklahoma means one of the best vacation spots is right in our own backyard. Doesn't this story need to be told? As filmmakers and photographers based right here in Oklahoma, we thought so. And hey, who doesn't like a good road trip? So, we packed up our cameras, teamed up with Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell and the Oklahoma Tourism and Recreation Department, and that's how this series was born.